Hey friends, uh, this is the sermon I prepared for uh, October 11th, 2020, um, but I, as I've done every week for the last, I don't know how many months, uh, I'm recording the post on here in case you missed it this morning or you couldn't make it to Thursday evening online worship, um, or if you just want to go back and uh, catch up on where we are in this series. And just because this is the age of COVID-19, so this is just one one other way that we've adapted as a church to do church a little differently um, when we can't gather together like we would that like we would like we did before the pandemic. So uh, the scripture I'm going to focus on is Exodus chapter 32 verses 1 through 14. So let me share that. Let me read that, and then I'll start um, sharing my thoughts on it. So story goes. The people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. So they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come on, make us gods who can lead us. As for this man Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what has happened to him. Aaron said to them, All right, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took out the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He collected them and tied them up in a cloth. Then he made a metal image of a bull calf. And the people declared, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf. And then Aaron announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. They got up early the next day and offered up entirely burned offerings and brought well-being sacrifices. The people sat down to eat and drink, and then got up to celebrate. The Lord spoke to Moses up on the mountain, Hurry up and go down. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, are ruining everything. They've already abandoned the path that I commanded. They have made a metal bull calf for themselves. They've bowed down to it and offered sacrifices to it and declared, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I've been watching these people. I've seen how stubborn they are. Now leave me alone. Let my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. But Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with, with great power, amazing force? Why should the Egyptians say he had an evil plan to take the people out and kill them in the mountains and so wipe them off the face of the earth? Calm down your fierce anger. Change your mind about doing terrible things to your own people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you yourself promised, I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And I've promised to give your descendants this whole land to possess for all time. Then the Lord changed his mind about the terrible things he said he would do to his people. Word of God for the people of God, we said, thanks be to God. Now, uh, I've shared before that I was a trumpet major in college. I started as a music education major, thought I wanted to be a band director, and then I um, eventually, middle of my sophomore year, dropped the education part, but still got the music degree. Um, and, and I think, I think like, like most of us who went to college, I romanticized those years. I graduated in 2015, so I haven't been out that long, but Still, I think the romanticizing started about a month or two after graduation. Um, I am sure that it was not as wonderful as I start to remember it. Uh, um, but at the root of it, when I think back on those four years, at the root of it, I think the work of a music student really did give me a lot of meaning and a lot of purpose and direction in those though in in my life in those four years for all the good parts of it it did give me a, and th there were certainly healthy and unhealthy parts of that um, so on, on the on the healthy side i really found my tribe because of that life um, there there was among a lot of, of the music students there was a really deep community there 
all the time that we spent in rehearsals and performances, all of them, the, the really transformative experiences that we shared, all the growth that we had as musicians and as people, um, and just all the time we had to spend in the music building together, uh, uh, practicing, working on music theory, homework, um, just spending time there to, to escape from other things we should be doing. So on the healthy side, there was, there was a lot of that, and that gave me a lot in life, and I, I wouldn't give that up for anything. But on the unhealthy side... I sacrificed a lot of things that I probably should not have. Um, I, I gave up a lot of good things in the course of those four years. Um, I really didn't pay attention to my health, my physical health, mental health, emotional health during that time. Um, I got myself to this place where I, if I didn't spend two, at least two hours in a practice room every day, um, I would have all kinds of anxiety. Um, if I messed up a solo during an exam at the end of the semester, um, let alone during a performance, um, I myself was bad. Even if the professors, when they listened to it, even if the professors marked it off, all right, that was a simple mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. He'll still get an A or a B, whatever it was. Um, I myself was bad bad not my plan because my identity was so wrapped up in how i did as a music student how i was progressing or not progressing now, now today music continues to be a, in, an incredibly important part of my life um incredibly meaningful to me the work of being a better musician even though it's now now it's more of like a serious hobby uh the work of being a better musician continues to shape my life it does continue to give me some of that meaning and that purpose in that direction i have some really good friends in the um that i've gained from being in the westerville community band um and that's none of that's bad but today it's not up to the unhealthy level that it was when I was in college. Today, if I had to, um, if I suddenly had to stop, life would go on and it would continue to be meaningful in other ways. Now, th that's not to say that I have it all figured out. Um, I I've just, that specific piece of life, I've gotten a handle on that. There are plenty of other pieces of my life that I continue to identify with far too strongly. <laughs> but that part is in a healthier place than it was. So what about you? There, there. I try to have a core question for us all to reflect on as I share my thoughts. Um, but the core question for this week is: is what gives your life meaning and, and and purpose and direction? That's a big, big question. But it's a good question to really ask. And don't just stop at the Sunday school answer. What gives your life meaning, purpose, direction? Jesus does. Don't don't stop there. Um, just because this is your pastor asking or a pastor asking. Um, there are a lot of things that can give us meaning and a lot of things that can give us purpose. And it's not, none of it is necessarily bad. If it's outside of Jesus, that's not necessarily bad. But reflect on that. What gives your life meaning or purpose or direction? Now, as we reflect on that, the story before us is probably a, a pretty familiar story if, if we've grown up in the church, the, the, the story of the golden calf. And in the church, this has historically been the quintessential story of idolatry. The Israelites worshiping a golden calf on the, in the wilderness while Moses is up talking to God on Mount Sinai. Now, idolatry. <laughs> Normally, when we, we talk about that as something really obvious and awful, worshiping idols. But really, idolatry is something far sneakier than we would normally think, than, at least than we normally portray it. It's really, idolatry, it's really a, 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 a common piece of of human life, far more common than I'm really comfortable with, but it's it's more common than we think. So what what makes something an idol? Let's start there. The basic Christianese answer for this, the the language that we use in the church, is that an idol is something that we put in the place of God. Now, nothing wrong with that. It's not a wrong answer. That's fine. But but what does that really mean? 
Put in the place of God. What does that really mean? There, there are so many good ways to answer that question. I'm going to share what I think, but there are other good ways to answer this. And I could, I'm recording this on October 10th. I could think something different tomorrow when I'm preaching this in in person worship. Um, but for today, how I understand it, to have an idol is to look at something or someone else besides the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, besides Yahweh, to look there for final ultimate meaning and purpose and direction. To look somewhere else besides God for that ultimate meaning, purpose, and direction. So um, in the story, we see this. It's not just the golden calf that symbolized that. The, in the story, we hear the people yell at Aaron, make us gods who can lead us. The people are out in the wilderness. They have they have camped out. They've, they haven't been moving in a while. Their normal leader, Moses, has been gone for days, almost 40 days. That's over a month Moses has been gone. So they need guidance. They know they need this, so they take things into their own hands. In this really desperate situation, they take things into their own hands. And that's just a basic human tendency. Today, we live in an increasingly complex world. We feel the need for uh, for guidance, for protection, for comfort, for meaning. And we get a sense that that need is bigger than any normal human being or any earthly thing, bigger than what any of that can provide. So we raise, not not consciously, we, some, we unconsciously raise uh, something or someone up higher than they were meant to be, higher than our earthly station, and we locate there in that thing or in that person our source of meaning, our source of ultimate direction and ultimate purpose and protection. So in that light, again, we ask, what gives our life some meaning and purpose and direction? What is that for us? I'm not, I'm not condemning any of it. I'm just saying that idols are sneaky. When we don't have an awareness of ourselves and, and our own tendencies, um, when we have never really searched ourselves with that question, we can have a lot of things that give us meaning and purpose and direction. That's not bad, but idols can really sneak their way into those places when we raise them up to an unhealthy place. That's what we see, I think, in this story before us. Now to us, making a golden cap and building an altar in front of it, that seems like pretty obvious idol worship to us, right? The Ten Commandments, we know the Ten Commandments, that is obviously condemned there, but it was different for the ancient Israelites. As I understand it, my own limited understanding of this, um, I don't think that they one day woke up and decided to worship a golden cow god instead of Yahweh, who led them out of Egypt. I don't think it worked that way. Quick piece about the ancient religious context of this area, in this area between Egypt and Israel. Just I'm not an expert, but quick piece. Polytheism. Worshiping multiple gods. That was everywhere. That was the that was the norm. The 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 existence of multiple gods was just part of their worldview. That was how they viewed the world, the existence of these multiple gods. Um, now, right at the top of the Ten Commandments, it says, have no other gods before me. Now, notice it does not say there are no other gods, like we might imagine it today. It just says, don't have any before me. So there's an assumption in my own limited understanding. There's an assumption that there are other gods divine beings, deities out there. They are out there, but the Israelites are to be loyal to this God, Yahweh, and no others. Now, this idolatry, if we can understand it in that context, it it's, see, it's seemingly clearly condemned in the Ten Commandments, um, but it, it snuck up on Aaron and on the people. Moses left Aaron in charge, but Aaron is the one who made this calf. So what, what in the world happened? From Aaron, 
That's where Israel's priests come. They come from the line of Aaron. There is, it's only Aaron's tribe. That's who can be priest. No one, no one else can. So he's the original priest of them, but he's the one who makes the golden calf. So what in the world happened here? I can imagine a couple things. This is just imagining that none of this, I might be wrong. Who knows? But I, I don't think Aaron was leading them to actually worship a different God. Like, here's this golden bull calf God, and here's Yahweh. Let's leave behind Yahweh and worship this whole different deity in this golden calf. I think he was actually trying to help them, help the people stay faithful to Yahweh in a really desperate situation. Because the people are scared. They are anxious. They need certainty. They need security. And Moses was the mediator. He, they, the people would normally go to Moses to handle that. But he, he's nowhere to be seen. He's not there. And he's been gone for a while. So the people bring all of this to Aaron because he's the one in charge. He's got to deal with this. And they demand that Aaron make them other gods. So in this high pressure situation, Aaron makes this desperate attempt to, to try to keep everyone together because this was not just about their religious life. This was about their, the, the ties that held them together as a people. This was, this was desperate. If they didn't have anything holding them together as a people, well, they would just die out there in the wilderness. So Aaron makes this, makes this desperate attempt and he capitulates them a little bit. And he makes a golden calf. But I don't think he meant the calf to be a whole different God. Um, I think that he meant it to be a physical representation of Yahweh, to try to keep the people faithful to Yahweh. A golden calf, that was just a common religious symbol around other tribes, around other people groups in that same area. It was just a symbol that was out there. So I think Aaron capitulated just a little bit. Let's stay faithful to Yahweh. Let's make an image of Yahweh. To try to keep faithful, to try to keep together here. Now, that still falls under a, a, a thou shalt not, right? That still falls under there. Don't make any physical representation of Yahweh because of what will inevitably happen next. And we see that. Because it becomes clear, Aaron makes this calf god, whatever his original intention was, Aaron makes this calf god, and it becomes clear that the people will be worshiping this image as a whole different god. Here's calf god, here's Yahweh, let's leave Yahweh and worship calf god. Um, when that becomes clear, Aaron throws a Hail Mary, and he builds an altar, which they could do in Israelite life, builds an altar to Yahweh, to God, and declares a festival to the Lord, not to the golden calf but a festival to Yahweh to try to get a handle on the situation that is just a suddenly spiraling out of control. So in that way, idols are sneaky. <laughs> False gods can really easily sneak up on us. So that core question again, that in which we find meaning and purpose and direction, that in which we find all of that, not necessarily bad. But can you see how that thing in which we find meaning, purpose, direction, can you see how that thing might sneak its way up to an unhealthy place? No. It's clear idols look different today because um, for us in the West, the general religious landscape has, we've moved away from gold, silver, wood images for the most part. Um, but idols have just taken different forms. And they're just as sneaky. Because we live in an increasingly complex world. We have the same need for stability, for security. We have that same need as the Israelites did. And we can sing, we can say, we can profess that we find that safety and security in God. We can say that, but it's really easy to mistake other things for God. For example, I know from my own experience that it's really easy to make our work, our job, our occupation into an idol. 
especially if that work or if that job is connected with our deep-seated passions, what we love to do. And it's great to find a job that's really connected with what we love to do. That's not bad. We, If only we could all have a job like that. That's wonderful. But if you're like me, if you're like me, before we know it, our ultimate meaning and purpose and direction, we find that tied up with whatever the goals are of uh, of our position, of our um, of our clients, of our company, whatever of our job. That's our life is tied up with our identity. Our direction is tied up with all of that. And we don't really know how to take time away from it because that job is what we look to to order our life. Now, it's also really easy to locate God within systems, within systems of, uh, of human power. We imagine that the, the purposes of God align 100% with, with the goals, the policies, the actions, the agenda of, of, a, of a country, a specific party, a specific leader. And there's often no outright denial of Yahweh, no outright denial of Jesus. But just like when Aaron made the calf, we don't intend for it to take the place of God, but that's what happens. So we come easily maybe not intentionally, but easily to locate God within systems of power. So when the country goes to war, that war is apparently a holy war. When policies and actions of the rulers continue to oppress minority groups and they cry out that they can't breathe, we don't listen. And we baptize those policies and those actions because they're coming from a Christian nation. So obviously we're not oppressing anyone. And eventually we find ourselves taking cues from the powers that be for what to think, how to behave, how to treat other people instead of taking those cues from Jesus. But it's all hidden behind pseudo-Christian language. So it can't be an idol, right? It, it's, it's hard to pierce through that. So again, we keep asking, what gives our life meaning, purpose, direction, consciously and unconsciously? Small picture and big picture. And again, it's not necessarily bad. I'm not condemning any of it. I'm just saying it can sometimes just sneak up to an unhealthy level of importance. <laughs> Idols are sneaky. <laughs> So this story calls us to identify the idols in our lives. Who or what have we raised up to uh, raised up higher than they were meant to be? What or who besides Yahweh, besides Jesus, do we look to for ultimate meaning and direction and purpose in life? What are our golden calves? I keep saying this. But idols are sneaky and they're they're tricky. Um, it's so this is easier said than done. Self awareness is hard work because we all who belong to Church of the Savior we're all professing Christians. None of us have denied Jesus, at least that I know of. But it is really easy for a metaphorical golden calf to slide up there right alongside God. Now, we've been, we've been working through the grand story of the people of God since June. That's been this long worship series we've been going through. So we ask questions like, have we located God in anything or in anyone that goes against the grain of that story that we've been working through? The Jesus that we profess faith in. Have we gradually, without realizing it, located ultimate meaning and direction and purpose somewhere else or in someone else who is not Jesus? Maybe we call it Jesus. Maybe we baptize them in the name of Jesus metaphorically. But someone or something who is not Jesus. Now, I, I don't mean to make us paranoid. 
Because there are a lot of things that we can find meaning in that are perfectly fine when they're at a healthy place. But if we find something else or someone else is directing us, start investigating it. Get curious about it. What And look beneath the surface. If we identify something that's directing us, look beneath the surface and ask questions like, what meaning or what purpose do we search for that we think we've found there? What do we lack that we are looking for? And how can we come to locate our search for that meaning, our search for that purpose in the story of God's people? How can we locate that and look toward Jesus as we continue that search? Now, I can't answer those questions for you. I can certainly help, and we can certainly help each other in that search. Because human life, it just does not work. It is not sustainable. It is not life-giving. It is not ultimately meaningful. When we order our life, when we find our purpose outside of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus, outside of the grand story of the people of God, outside of the life of Jesus... Even if we profess our allegiance to Jesus, even if we say we believe in that story. So may we keep searching. May we keep searching. Dear friends, keep asking that question. Keep searching. Knowing that Jesus goes with you, the grace of God is with you. And that there's no condemnation in what we find. So dear friends, always remember, I love you and Jesus loves you. And there's just nothing you or I or anyone can do about that. Grace and peace, dear friends. Have a great day.